Hey everybody, welcome to another Lit X YouTube video. This video is gonna be a great one. This is actually about using games in your classroom and gamifying your classroom. It is led by Jason Nizovic and Mike Espinos, who are two amazing experts on this topic. I've watched them present it at a couple different cons and it is just amazing. So I, I'm so happy we're able to bring you this content and Jason is kind of putting together a couple follow-up panels about gaming in the classroom. Jason and Mike are doing that after this one. So if you dig this video, like and subscribe it and then come back for more because I would say over the summer, there's gonna be a couple more of these gaming panels coming. I'm very excited to bring this to you. So yeah, without any further ado, let's get into gaming in your classroom 101. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another uh, Lit X conversation. I am Jason Nisovic. You'll see me popping up here and there on the different panels that we've done. And uh, joining us today is Mike Espinos, one of my wonderful colleagues who has run gaming panels with me before. And today we're going to do something a little different. You know, for the most part, we've been talking about other sorts of pop culture resources that you can bring to the classroom, mostly graphic novels. But we're also going to focus on things like using games in the classroom and uh, all the different ways that they can uh, manifest. And we've got a couple of experts, including me, on this uh, initial uh, Games 101 panel. So to introduce ourselves, you know, I am a 14 year veteran teacher and I've been using games pretty much the entire time. Uh, they've been getting better and better. I started very, very simple. And now, you know, I can talk about the different ways that I've, you know, incorporated games across an entire semester of education. Uh, Mike, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm Mike Espinos, um, about 10 years in education, seven of which is in the classroom. I was a middle school STEM educator. And then the most recent three years have been on the dark side with administration. And yeah, I've been, I mean, my gaming credentials go back forever. I've been playing as long as I can remember. And it's always something I've enjoyed. Oh, absolutely. You know, going back to obviously playing games as kids and then realizing that, you know, when we became adults that uh, the fun didn't have to stop, right? <laughs> as long as we, uh, gave it a purpose for the most part. Sometimes you don't even have to give it a purpose. So let's go ahead and share the screen just to give you our credentials. So feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions or you need any suggestions or ideas. Uh, but we're gonna talk about a little bit of just kind of getting off the ground and getting started if you want to begin incorporating a little bit of fun into your classroom. And so the first question is, why would you even want to? And so the, <laughs> I mean, I'm asking this question, of course, you know, uh, very uh, kind of out there, unrealistically, because for the most part, your students want to enjoy themselves and you as an educator, I hope, want to enjoy themselves. Uh, Mike, what were some of your like initial kind of forays into gaming and trying to incorporate this in the classroom? Well. Um, first I'm going to sound a little, I'm going to sound a little old, like one of the old guys, well, back in my day. Um, but I remember about five or six years ago when all of a sudden everybody started screaming about gamification and education and we got to gamify everything, game this. And I'm like, we've been doing that. Like it's, it's, it's having fun. I don't, I, you know, it's, <laughs> but, um, a big part of, of gaming in the classroom is, the fact that when you start gaming, uh, any sort of gaming, if I stuck a board game in front of you, most people could probably figure out a way to play it. If you stick a pair of dice in front of people, they're going to turn it into a game. It doesn't matter. Um, it's, a, it's a framework that we have all built uh, stories around. We all built ways of doing things around. So bringing in gaming into the classroom is just asking your kids to use an existing framework and apply it to something new that they're learning. And when they start making their own games or they start playing games based around those things, they start interacting with the material in a way that you don't expect. And it, it solidifies their understanding of it and, it. and it really brings those concepts home because when you have to create a rule set around something you're doing, you definitely have to understand it first. Um, 
but yeah, I, and I'm, I'm trying to look at the bullet points. It, imagination begins with play. That is absolutely true. Uh, once you start imagining things, you can also start interacting with some of the thoughts and ideas of their work, uh, of how they work in new and interesting ways. And in the classroom, the concepts of gaming could also be used as a, um, they can be used as a stand-in for some of the more difficult ideas we have to think of. For example, if you were going to be teaching students, um, if you're going to be teaching students about race or about social interaction and things like that, it might be easier to talk about that in the context of something um, of like a game like, okay, so not all orcs are bad or things like that. It, it became a thing that was, it became easier to, to bring about with less potential potholes because some people are uncomfortable with topics and it's easier to use a, a, a cultural stand in that we all understand. And Absolutely. yeah. Uh, to be uh, clear, uh, my background is mainly high school. Uh, Mike's is mainly middle school. I have uh, taught kids uh, things like improv as young as eight years old. And so we are no stranger to kind of getting, you know, kids and bridging them into talking about, you know, more serious topics, starting with something that might be a little bit more accessible. And so now, Mike, you know, you're a great person to talk to you about all of this because you have uh, experienced some really high level play, some really high order thinking you've incorporated into your kind of gamings. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so um, if I think if I think what you're referring to is right, the I used a modified version of Dungeons and Dragons in the middle school environment in order to teach social skills uh, to students who are in our life skills program. Um, well, actually, they were in a structured special ed environment, which is a minor distinction. Um, but these students were struggling with the concepts of working with other people, with working in a team, with the cons, with with understanding that their actions have consequences, and we could try and explain that to them until we ran out of air, and they were just not taking to it. But when we asked them to play a game where the core elements were teamwork and understanding your consequences, and um, and used the the structure of character development to build up the skills that the students needed i saw in one week or one 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 period a week i would play this game with the kids and we saw more growth in six weeks than we had seen all school year uh from them and it was amazing and i i wish i i wish i could just go on about that forever but there's a lot of data out there that gaming as therapy and gaming as a means of um, conveying ideas is a really excellent means of doing so. And one of the, my favorite things about it is that in school, you get asked a question, you give an answer, you're right or wrong, that's it. I mean, sometimes it's, you ask a question, you give your opinion and you find out that even though opinions can't necessarily be wrong, other people can still think you're wrong and it's weird. Um, so some students are very afraid to make choices in that situation because there's a consequence for not making the right choice. And we've all seen it when we ask the kids, hey, what would you like? And the first kid says, I want this. And then every kid after them just says, yeah, I want that. I want that. Because you didn't yell at him for making that choice. So it's just easier for me to go with it. Sure. And in a game, you can make a choice. And depending on what you're doing, uh, the choices you make, you know, as you play a card, oh, that was the wrong card. You know, this happened, but I don't have to go home and explain to my parents why I played the wrong card. There's no grade, there's no points off. And that's, I think, much safer for, for allowing students to explore what happens when you make bad choices. 100% agree with that. In the classes that I've run, you know, there's a reason why I have the game Werewolf on the screen here, which is the classic game of mob justice and trying to figure out who is the traitor among you in a group. Uh, if you try to incorporate kind of like a, a real world kind of consequences and any sort of like on a personal level among students, like that's, you can't do that, right? You can't like have peers judge each other. You can't have them talk about each other on like a personal level. Of course, of course you can't do that. 
But if you are trying to, you know, whether you're teaching something like the lottery, you know, the, the short story, the lottery, or if you're trying to teach something like different sociology concepts, or in my case, it was personality types, type A versus type B, you can circle up your kids and you can have them play this game where they're throwing wild accusations at each other for basically no reason. And you can use that sort of play behavior to then, and I'm getting ahead of ourselves, but bridge into the <laughs> lesson that you're trying to get with some really low stakes. Because, you know, Absolutely. In, they're, uh, they're, you know, eliminating each other from the game, but they're having trouble. They are having fun doing it, even as, you know, they're falling one by one. Yeah. And so then you have, you know, explore, you know, more than just new worlds. They're exploring themselves. They're exploring, you know, the ways that they interact with their environment. And then again, you know, in Werewolf, you kill each other. But yeah, there's no punishment. There's no like, social ramifications of judging any one person. So this kind of opens up in avenues of conversation that we never had before. Yeah. You know, would you agree? Yeah, no. I'd also say that werewolf is what happens if the Stanford prison experiment didn't ruin lives. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, no, werewolf's a great game um, for that. And there really is, there's stakes to the game. Um, but it also allows you to explore behaviors. And I, I, that's really neat. Yeah, you're right. We are getting ahead of ourselves. But I mean, it's a, it's a safe place where a, anyone can indulge in being the bad guy without necessarily, you know, it, it, who knows what the next round is going to bring. So you just kind of eventually you play enough games and you realize that you almost ruined the game by playing it because you not only do you get to know the people but you also the behaviors and you find that most people will eventually just choose to be the good person in the end eh, after they've tested out whatever their behaviors are that they want to so for sure and so you know if circling up in in my classroom's case 30 students to play a massive game of werewolf oh. seems a little bit intimidating. I know, <laughs> I have my notepad, I have my class list, I'm checking people <laughs> off as I go. I mean, I'm a crazy person. Uh, if that's a little bit intimidating for you, something that you can start, you know, that's very inexpensive, you know, if you work through your local game store, some people say, oh yeah, order a pile of dice through Amazon. I suggest going through your local game store, but getting, you know, just a couple of sets of D6s, six-sided dice. And with D6s, with these dice, you can come up with lessons for just about anything that you can, you know, add a little bit of randomness, add a little bit of chance, and suddenly your lessons can become that much more engaging. And I'll expand yeah, yeah. on that in just a moment. You actually just reminded me that um, there's a book out by Steve Jackson Games, and it's called Random Fun Generator. And it's, it's a, like a bound book, and you just open to any page, and as long as you have D6s, you can play the game on that page. It's like one page games. And they just, they're fun games that teach you whatever, like they're the different concepts and it's all just D6 based. Exactly. You know, it, it's, it's funny just adding that little extra element of rolling a thing <laughs> can make things all the more uh, engaging. So you said Steve Jackson? Yeah, Steve Jackson games, uh, the makers of Munchkin and a lot of other games. Oh yes, I am familiar. <laughs> and so like, uh, one of the, the stress points, because we've done this before, we've, we've given this you know, discussion before at different cons, and one of the things that causes stress with a lot of teachers is, you know, how do I prove it has worth to my administrator? How do I prove that you know, I'm doing this not just to you know, uh, mess around with my kids, but that it has a higher purpose? And I'm saying this as someone who played a 30-person game of Werewolf in front of my evaluator. <laughs> and uh, they got really into it because the kids were into it, you know? And so, of course, we want to start with, you know, the relevant learning intention. You know, what is the goal? You know, start with that at the beginning. You know, Mike and I will never judge you if you want to just play with your kids for fun on some random day, because sometimes kids just need to not be stressed out for an hour. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, if you're worried about that, you know, just do it like you would with any other lesson. Start at the end. What is your goal? And so, you know, I taught government for a good number of years. 
And so one of the things that is required of us here in Illinois is we have to demonstrate kind of the way that, you know, the government functions, that this is just one of the, the numerous standards that we have to meet in US government. And so to help illustrate the way that a nation needs to be run, there is an entire online uh, game that we play over the course of a semester called Nation States. And Nation States is this absolutely free game. The kids log in. I have a set of guidelines when they're creating their nation and they have to log in, you know, X number of times a week and they have to make decisions for their country. And then their country, their stats change as they go. And the, the year that I implemented nation states, uh, my test score started to go up because kids understood a little bit more about the decision-making process and the value of democracy versus dictatorship, because you can absolutely make your nation states a dictatorship and just yeah. decide and like limit everybody's freedom. But the ramifications to your nation start to show over time. And so trying to maintain that balance of democracy is something that caused a lot of really good discussions. Uh, there's also something like super fight. So if you're trying to, you know, build uh, debating skills, if you want to, you know, start conversations, if you want to introduce political argument, you can start with something like super fight and you can have ridiculous ar arguments. Like uh, the whole point of the game is, you have two cards uh, that are chosen, and then you have to argue your side about why your thing would win in a fight. So in this case, it was a college acapella group versus Sasquatch. And then you can add other things to them if you want to make it more fun or more interesting. But if you want to start either a debate unit or a political parties unit or something like that with you know, something that is more accessible, I would suggest starting with something like Super Fight. Mike, you have any ideas? Um, I mean, outside of like government and things like that, there's. Oh, it doesn't have to be my thing. It yeah, totally no, I it. know. Like <laughs> for me, um, I mean, a lot of the games I, I started with the students were like just team challenges because I have um, I was teaching robotics and that's a that is a team class if there ever it was one. And so I would I would turn the build competitions into a robotics competition. So for example, if we're if I'm teaching the concept of gear ratios, well, we're having a race. And that's where you have to decide where are you gonna trade off um are we gonna trade off torque for speed? And you have to figure out how you're gonna do that. And the students would then figure it out. Um and a lot of other concepts that would go into it. So instead of just teaching about gear ratios and making things spin at different speeds, what we would do is we would have a race for that uh, and the, the 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 outcome of the race the person would have to explain why they make the choice they make and things like that but really the kids were just there to see who was the fastest and it was a and it was interesting to see them making the choices of like weight and design and trying out different shapes because we've all seen you know you put four wheels you know two in front two in back and it goes fast and that's great but the students realized that you, uh, the ones who were most successful, the ones who realized you didn't have to have four wheels. It was when you realize you don't have to follow the framework of what you're already seeing and that the game allows you to make choices and test them out in a way that um, allows you to iterate on failure in a different way. And playing, um, it, it's, it really is part of the scientific uh, process and, and the the concepts become more solid when you fail i think than when you succeed yeah the the discussion that can come up with like why do you think your your uh, gears failed why do you think your argument failed why do you think your nation failed hey did you know that a nation can fail because they have right like that's sort of you know just grounding to start that conversation is very valuable. I totally agree. Uh, and so now is where we get messy because we can talk about the actual execution. Maybe we can talk about a couple of times where it didn't go so well and how we kept going anyway. And so I wanna start with uh, one of the earliest games that I incorporated into my psychology class. 
And that was uh, this game that you see on the screen, 100 the hard way. And so I took my own advice early on in my career and I took a bunch of D6s and I'm like, how can I incorporate this into my class? And so this was the stress unit talking about stress and you know the way that it makes our body change and feel. And so I wanted a game that would induce stress in a very casual sort of way. And so this was a game where they were racing, they grab D6, they roll it, they competitively roll it until they, some person rolls a six. When that person rolls a six, they start writing one, two, three, four, five, six. And they're trying to write all of the numbers between one and a hundred. If another person at the table rolls a six, that person yells, stop. The person who's writing stops writing. And the person who just rolled a six begins writing. And it's cumulative. So if you left off at 32, when you roll a six again, you can continue from 32, 33, 34, 35, right? And so when I first ran this game, what I didn't anticipate was the competitiveness and how there were certain students, even at age 16, age 17, who had a little bit of a self-control issue and they would sometimes grab their opponent's die and take it away from them while they continued writing, right? Like, <laughs> hey, that's, that's cheating. Why are you cheating at this game? And so like taking into account some of the factors that you, know, you need to consider, like uh, the maturity level of your group, the size of your group. You know, like I said, I worked with you know, classes of 30. Uh, Mike, can you talk about maybe some of the considerations you didn't maybe take into account before you started playing a couple games? Yeah, um, there was a, I was actually working with adults and I was trying to teach a concept. Um, I, was, I was essentially trying to teach adults the refugee crisis concept and we were playing a D&D game. Um, and I think I did too good of a job because what ended up happening is I had um, people at the table fighting because they were so invested in, in their ideas that they were emotionally involved and ended up with tears. And I was like, okay, um, you all did a very good job, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna just take a hard stop right here and we're gonna have to do something else because you know, we can't, this, we can't continue this. Um, group size matters, group personalities matter. There is, there's a, there, there, everyone has a, their own play style, depending on what there is. Some people are very competitive. Some people are sit back and watch. My, uh, my wife, for instance, refuses to compete with people. She will let everybody win a game because she's like, okay, they'll make them happy. It's, mm -hmm. it's like, and it drives, it drives other people up a wall that she refuses to compete because, you know, for them, the competition is the fun part. And so you have to look at the, the composition of the group and maybe make changes on the fly. It's okay to say this isn't working. Like we got to change something. The rules may be written in, down, but that they're not written in stone. So you just mm -hmm. make sure that what you're doing um, works, be flexible and yeah, group size for sure. I mean, there are some games, for example, uh, group size is a, is a major consideration in any storytelling game because you have to give people the time to showcase themselves. And a lot of, a lot of like tabletop RPGs, uh, the person's just sitting there doing nothing. And there's a constant conversation among the people who run those games of, well, how do you keep people off their phone? How do you keep them from being bored? And the constant response is, well, just be more engaging okay, that's not an answer. <laughs> um, one of the things I found that if you're, if you're running a, like a tabletop game with students, especially what I do is I write each of their names on a post-it note and then I stack the post-it notes up and then whatever post-it note is up, I'm going to try and find a way to spotlight that person. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as I find that way to spotlight that person, I peel the post-it note off and I put it on the bottom of the stack and then I can go through this way. Nobody's able to sit there without um, so nobody's able to sit there without either getting a chance or at least acknowledging their, their presence and inclusion in the game. And that's important. Um, accessibility is something I could go on forever. There's a lot of different ways that we 
don't realize that accessibility is difficult for something that we're doing. Everything from how uh, the placement of the board, for example, if you have a student who's in a wheelchair or has mobility issues, mm -hmm. it may make sense to place the board in the center of the table generally, because this way everyone can see it, everyone can access it. But that student, depending on where they're placed, is not going to be able to just get up and lean forward to reach for what they're looking for. So you need to make sure that you're being aware of other people's needs. Um, and there's many other, other ways that you can have accessibility issues with students. Um, I don't know about you, but I have a lot of students who pretend they don't have glasses and can't see anything in my class. So that was a that was an issue that we had to run into as well. Um, and I found that, you know, everything from just making the text bigger in slides to just like reminders and like, hey, you know, did you forget your glasses today or whatever? Mm -hmm. But like there's 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 ways that students will be kept from participating. And they won't tell you about that you have to be aware of. So, yeah. Yes. And so while you were talking about accessibility issues, I was going back and pondering, you know, the 100 the hard way game, which I still do, by the way. I haven't abandoned the game. I just make it clear now at the outset that, hey, you can't do that. That's cheating. Um, and so if there is an issue with mobility in playing a game like this, you know, there are there are options, you know, if you have access to a tablet for that student, you can use an online dice roller, you know, I think you can even like in Google, you can just like there is a dice roller, we can just roll a d6 through Google, right? So yeah. like, those sorts of considerations are, of course, very important. You don't want to leave anybody out of the fun, you know, when you're designing these games. The uh, clarity of instructions is so important as well. You want to make sure that when they sit down, you know, you demonstrate it maybe once, you know, the, the game is easy enough to figure out. You don't want to sit, you know, uh, betrayal at, you know, House on the Haunted Hill with your kids. You don't want to try and do something like that in 50 minutes, obviously. Uh, my example for that is I did uh, play a couple of years in a row. I did play Liar's Dice. I had kids split up into groups and I demonstrated a simpler form of the game Liar's Dice, which is a, a, a cup game where you have your dice under a cup and then you wager, you know, obviously not with the money. And so what I discovered was the rules for Liar's Dice or Peruto, uh, when somebody has one die left, the rules of the game kind of change and it becomes a much more higher stakes sort of game. Your options become limited. And so what I did while, that, while using this game was I just threw those rules out and I just kept the rules consistent all the way down to the end. And what I found was, you know, is it the, the truest form of the game? No, but it proves the point that I'm trying to make in the class, which was uh, I had a list of brain parts, the different brain parts that the kids were studying. And I asked the question, how does this game involve this specific brain part and so they had to ponder okay while i'm playing the game my occipital lobe allows my eyes to see you know so like that sort of thing just to make it more fun uh by simplifying the game just a little bit it allowed them to play it more so they weren't constantly going back to the rules you know in the course of uh, a class time they could get three or four solid games of this before we then turned back to uh the lesson so Claire, did you ever have a time where, oh, yeah. you know, it, it became unclear, like your kids were kind of flailing? Oh yeah. I mean, anything that, any, any instructions that are like, can't fit on a single slide or don't fit on a single page or can't be like, can't be demonstrated in 10 minutes or less, you're in trouble. Like if mm -hmm. there's, when you start getting into things that like have if then else exceptions, then you got, the game is probably not going to work in a single day. If this is a big thing that you're doing, that's cool. T take the time, explain it, walk through it, work with the students. But if you're looking for this to be a single one-off activity, under like the ability, the clarity of instructions is the most important thing possible. Um, in narrow scenarios, it is possible to teach people as they play. There's a handful of games like that. Uh, Exploding Kittens comes to mind. Yes. <laughs> that's a pretty, it's a pretty simple game. 
Um, you just keep drawing until you get a, a exploding kitten and everything else is explained on the cards. That's it. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's a couple extra rules, but like, you know, you can jot those down in two sentences. Right. So that's a well-designed game. It's kind of like the greatest tutorial in any video game is Super Mario Brothers, the first game, because everything happens in the first, like, you know, 10 screens. Mm -hmm. You learn everything you need to know. And there's no words. There's no, you don't need the instruction manual, which is weird. Um, all of that stuff. You just, it just happens. You go right till you can't go right anymore. That's mm -hmm. the concept. Um, <laughs> I love it. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. So like all of these different factors that come into it, you know, we're, we're here to tell you that if you try something and you find that there was something that didn't work about it, or if it was, you know, too complicated, don't abandon it, just fix it, try it again, you know, recognize what went wrong and, you know, recommit yourself to the fun, you know, if you can, uh, that's, you know, something that is a natural part of the learning process. And so then after you're done, after you've played the game, do you have that effective way of tying it back to the point? Do you have, you know, if you're just playing to have a fun afternoon, again, totally fine and we're not judging. But if you are being evaluated or you want to call the attention of your administrator, if you want to call their attention and say, here's what I'm doing that is different, you got to follow it up. And so after playing 100 the hard way, I, the first time I played it, I tied it to the nervous systems. And so they were experiencing stress. And so I asked the question, how did the nervous systems of your body help or hurt you during the course of this game? And so I moved that online to a Google form. And so it was very simple for me, kind of like as an exit sort of activity where they can submit it to me, I can make sure that they understood how the nervous systems worked. And then the game was a success. And they're not even going to remember the assessment part, really. <laughs> you know, if they get asked, what did you do at school today? Then they'll be like, oh my God, I played this game and it was stressful, but it was fun. Right. And so you can kind of slip in that assessment part at the end and uh you know still come off as you know being the cool person who tried to make things uh fun for them you know mike uh, what do you have to add about this no absolutely i was gonna say evaluation is important um and the thing is you don't have to the game itself doesn't have to include the lesson but you have to be able to tie what you did in the game to what you're trying to teach the kids um i was I was um, a coach for a cybersecurity team and so cool. we, <laughs> it is neat. I always feel weird saying that. Um, and we were struggling with teamwork. Everybody wanted to be the elite hacker. Nobody wanted to do the actual hard work of being good at it. <laughs> and it was, it was all, it was all leaders and no, and no, nobody who's willing to work. So what we found is I started playing D and D with them and you can't just all be, you can't just all run off and do whatever you feel like in that game, but you just all end up dead. It's how it works. Um, Never split the party. No, that's, that's a rule. <laughs> and what I found is we were just playing this on the, on the days that we didn't practice, but the kids wanted to hang out. And so I, I started running it and then I let them run it. And when we quickly found that their teamwork skills when we were playing together were improving, because they'd actually learned that they have to depend on each other. They have to assign tasks. They have roles that they're supposed to fill that they're good at. And they, and they were actually, and then we talked about how we translated the concepts of what we were doing in D and D to the concepts of teamwork and what we're doing in cybersecurity, which doesn't seem like it would be the same thing, but there, there really are, there are support roles. There's, there's forward facing roles. There's all of those things where, you know, it was just, for me, it started off as a time filler, but I was able to work it back into what we were doing. And it was really, it was a, it was a great way to teach a concept, but I didn't make playing D&D &D be cybersecurity. I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. I actually had a card game for cybersecurity concepts that was really fun from the University of Texas. Ooh. But, um, yeah, but the, it wasn't, it was the play was for fun to teach 
the greater concept by going back to what we did. And I think that's important too, because otherwise it just looks like you're forcing education on somebody and, it, and adding dice and the kids are gonna see right through that. Yes, 100%. You know, it, <laughs> it, it, it's a, a fine line to walk, you know, cause we do understand that like, if a game is too on the face of it educational, if you strip out too many of the fun elements, you know, it's, uh, it's like Oreos without the cream, right? Yeah. You're kind of, you know, giving them something that's too watered down for them to, you know, get that, ex that joyous experience, you know? Yeah. So walking the line is totally important. Yeah, I think so there's then, only one uh, game that ever got away with that. And that was Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego? Oh, <sighs> that was the only game that ever got away with that concept. Like, let's just make an education game that's fun. One game. Right, a game that made me super excited to turn to a glossary and like, ah, ah, Buenos Aires, <laughs> like, like, oh my God, what, what is this kind? You know, uh, you're totally right. And then there was like all the spinoffs too. Yeah, and so we're I in time, like, and yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they did all a good right. job with that one. <laughs> Let's do a rapid fire. Let's talk about like, like if we wanted to take you know a couple of different elements. Now we've already talked a little bit about role-playing games. Now you worked with uh, small groups, correct? When it comes to playing D&D? &D? Um, yes, I worked with small groups or I worked with lots of small groups by taking a large group and dividing it up into smaller groups. Sure. And so, you know, the, the question that a lot of people tend to have is, is there a way that I could take kind of role-playing elements and apply them to a larger group of people? And the answer is yes, of course. Uh, there are classrooms, there are people, and we can, we can of course expand on this in future videos if people want, uh, where an entire semester uh, becomes a competition. You know, you can divide kids into houses a la Hogwarts and you can have different challenges for them. You can have, you know, different groups of students earn points. You can turn it into a competition or not. You know, you can have them collectively work towards a goal, but that sort of gamification process doesn't have to be deep immersion into a fantasy world. Oh. You can, you know, strip it down to its most like serotonin inducing components of earning points and earning renown for your team. You know, so something like that, you know, a role playing game doesn't have to be complex in that way. Uh, what about playing cards? What are some ideas you might have, Mike, for some playing cards? How might you incorporate that into the classroom? Playing cards give you a lot to work with. Um, at the surface, you have four suits that you can divide them into. So you obviously have four different um, categories right there. But you also have face cards uh, versus number cards, which gives you a an interesting balance because you only have, depending on where you put the ace, you only have three to four face cards. Um, so that gives you already a high, like a, a percentage to work with if you're going to play something along those lines. Um, the nice thing about playing cards is everybody knows them. Like nobody's unaware of how a deck of playing cards work. They, we've all seen them before. Um, and you have an, you have more cards than you have members of a class. And depending on how rough your class sizes are, you might actually be able to do two cards. So you could do a matching with them. You could do all sorts of things. Um, there's there's really like an endless amount of things you can do with a deck of playing cards and that's kind of like i said earlier if you leave, if you just left a deck of playing cards with kids they would start playing immediately even if they didn't know the rules of a game my kids my own children have come up with games with just decks of playing cards laying around and it's really fun because watching them make up a game is like watching calvin ball it is it is great <laughs> um but yeah, and I mean, with any of these, with any of these situations, the key thing is who the students are playing against. Playing against each other is a risky proposition if it's groups and things like that, because you end up having the team dynamic that um, tribalism and all of that that comes from it, which can get super intense in in an education setting. Uh, whenever possible, I always have to. I like to have the students play against me as the adversary. Because if they get mad at me, then they're mad at their teacher. Oh, no, that's not unusual. <laughs> Versus mad at each other. I don't want to ruin friendships or, or start trouble that doesn't need to be there that carries over somewhere else in the school day. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, it's, it's, or 
the the other thing is in the rare cases if you can get them to play against themselves that's really important and the thing that i found that engages students whenever you play a game with them is intermittent rewards if it's you win you get the thing that's fine um but i like to have it so that if you win you get the thing and occasionally at other times you might do something special and you get the thing you're seeking for the game and intermittent rewards actually um well jason you probably know the the psychological concept that's how you keep people coming back oh yeah the slot uh, machine more. Effect, yeah. yeah that's exactly it and if you do that they're going to engage with it a lot more because i can tell you there's a lot of students who will do whatever it takes to get the points that they're looking for to be done they have a they have a goal whether it's a a or a b or just good enough to be considered done mm -hmm. um but when you have that when you ha when you adjust the system to make it more random those kids will just keep playing it's it's really great to see them continue to engage with it and so yeah and you can do that with cards um and that's why i say the face cards and all that because those are much rare so you can do anything with that yeah absolutely and the uh the ideas that come to my mind, you know, you talked about the kids being mad at the teacher and what else is new. My initial idea is you could use cards or you could use dice to actually take blame off of yourself. And so like, <laughs> if you are choosing like a participant in a lab or like uh, uh, someone who could answer a question, if you determine it by picking from a predetermined number of cards and you can like, you know, whoever's sitting in desk nine of diamonds, right? You're gonna come up and draw us a picture or you're gonna come up and, you know. Uh, so you can make that more of a random sort of gamified way to encourage participation. And then it's like, hey, your number hasn't come up in a while. And so you can, you know, participate with us and you can do that. Yeah. Uh, so like that, when we talk about like simplifying it down to its core elements, that's what we mean. Yeah. Sometimes the thrill of just drawing a card can be way better than the teacher going, oh, you, <laughs> you are going to do this today. It's like, well, uh, my number came up. What are you going to do? Right. I was actually thinking of something with cards that would be fun in chemistry. If you were to study, um, if you were like studying the different elements, if you were to create um, a card set using them, like, you know, the two of clubs is sodium and, you know, the five of diamonds is calcium. And then so the kids would randomly find somebody else and they would hold their cards up. What what do you make when you put them together? Mm -hmm. Well, hydrogen and uh, oxygen, we're going to have water, if, depending on how you do it. And then what's the what was the numbers you need? And then versus, hey, I got hydrogen and, you know, whatever carbon or I get what, you know, whatever. What are we going to come up with? Can you make anything? What is it? And like that would be a fun way to use the cards just as a as a randomization tool but also the kids will start looking for who has the thing that they want which means you know if, if you're looking to make something cool you're going to go find the person who has that card and that that means you're already thinking about where you want to be next which means you understand the concept and it'll be a fun way to see that oh my god there is like a game in there that is way too smart for me where like with a deck of cards kind of like scrabble you're like making different compounds <laughs> and like... oh, no it exists it's actually called oh. flux oh my god yeah i want to uh, play that and fail at it spectacularly so flux is a, is a card game that they make it in a million different like types it's mm -hmm. almost there's i think they're, between flux and munchkin there's a there's so many different types of cards and they have them for all the fandoms but they also have them for i, I want to say chemistry um, biology, they have them for a bunch of different things. And the idea of flux is you just draw and you, you're you trying to reach a goal. There's one goal, one to two goals on the table. And it's, you have to put down this combination of cards. So for the chemistry one, it was, you know, you have to, we need water. So it'd be hydrogen and oxygen. Well, if you have the hydrogen card and I have the oxygen card, we got to figure out, and it's, we could bargain. There's cards that move things around. Flux is a really fun game. It's easy to oh, understand yeah. and it's very smart. Yeah, the rules kind of unfold as you pull cards from the deck. So yes. there isn't one standard way to play. I love it. Uh, and then finally, uh, we are going to be running short on time. Uh, shortly. Sorry. Uh, it, no, please, this has been excellent. And we do uh, plan on expanding our conversation and getting into more specific things in future videos, which of course, you know, the audience can send us any suggestions that you might have. 
uh, but online games. Now, something that, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but at one point when you had your, was it robotics class, you had them actually build a uh, machine that could play Mario, is that right? Um, okay, so yes and no. I taught them how to make, uh, they did make robots that could play Mario, but that came naturally. I had created a, uh, I'd created a, a Mario Brothers game that was the size of a, like a banquet table. It was an eight foot table. And I used um, a Makey Makey. Um, and I used Super Mario Brothers online, which allowed me to adjust the inputs. And then I used copper tape. And so the students would have to press and it was a teamwork game where originally it was built as a teamwork game. And then my robotic students went and ruined it for me. Um, they would have to stand here and with an eight foot table, you can't reach the entire controller because left is all, all the way to the left, right is all the way to the right. And then in the middle I had uh, um, jump. And then I also had, a, a, each, each spot had two buttons. It was like left and run fast, right. I think right was just right because it was Mario Brothers. You just go right. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a right and up. And then um, the middle one was jump and down and the students had to play it and you would think it's not that hard because the person who's just going right just holds down the right button and then the person jumping jumps but they would anticipate what the other one's doing and their timing was different and so what ended up happening is to be successful they had to play it where the person who was in charge of the jump was just calling it out and the other people had to listen and they got used to the delay of the people and nobody got past world one dash two nobody some people got close until my robotics kids came along then they built one robot with four servos that would go up and down and activate the button and so mm -hmm. what they started doing is um they activated the buttons and all they had to do was just time the jumps so that was just a matter of, of programming and they would just time the jumps over and over again and they ended up going i think to world um, I think they got all the way to world two before they to two one before they got bored of trying to program out the nanoseconds of oh, sure. every jump. <laughs> but they yeah. worked on it for like solid two weeks. It was cool. That's how AIs do it. That's how AIs learn how to play games through that sort of trial fair trial error situation. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I remember that was a very cool story that you told. I was very like take I was thinking about that for days after yeah, you and, told me that story. The thing is that I didn't even intend for that to happen. They just said, could we make this in our free time? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> of course. That'd be awesome. That's the best way to learn is to just, you know, yeah. do it yourself, you know. Uh, so then with online games, the ideas that I have, um, you know, you can argue whether or not a crossword puzzle is actually a game. But if you are diving in for the very first time and you want to make things a little more entertaining, there is a free puzzle maker that you can see here on the URL. Uh, that's, you know, a way to at least make it a little bit more engaging, you know, and then from there, as you feel more comfortable, you can start to incorporate some of the ideas that we presented here. Uh, Kia is a paid service. You know, I'm very fortunate enough to have a district that, you know, comps me for that. Uh, but you can put in content you can put in ideas and vocabulary and things like that. And you can make things like a battleship game. You can make a uh, uh, guessing game. You can do a variety of different activities with that. And it saves from year to year. So I have a, a backlog of different activities that I break out throughout the course of the year. I already mentioned nation states. You can, you know, Quizlet is a classic. You turn vocab into uh, games and different activities. Kahoot is where you can turn your classroom into a game show. That's probably yeah. the most famous one on this list, as far as I can tell. So I almost didn't type that at all because it's yeah. Scary. You gotta you gotta close the door when you play a Kahoot. You'll have kids running from classrooms down the hall when they hear mm -hmm. that music. <laughs> it, I was very happy to play Kahoot when we were all on quarantine. You know, when I had students yeah. who were remote and I could still broadcast. You know, and we could play Kahoot. So it got us through some tough times. So I'm not gonna. You know, yeah, ever. Oh, no. I love Kahoot. It's a lot of work to make a Kahoot, but man, it you can you can get some real traction out of it with the students. 
for sure. Yeah, I always, I think it's a triumph when a, so, you know, a classroom down the way has kids going, yeah, as a class, like I'll never get mad at that. Uh, so those are some of my, uh, oh, and then Mike, do you want to talk about D&D Beyond for a second? Um, yeah, I was going to say that D&D Beyond, it's a, um, during the quarantine and everything, they're offering up free resources. So if you've never really done D&D, they have everything you need is available for free. And um, and you can even make an account with any of the single sign-ons that you have already. Uh, uh, Google, I think Facebook, Twitch, Apple ID, all of those things. Um, but with those, it, it they're giving you a free, I think two different starter um, starter modules that you can run and the player's handbook, which is enough to just get a taste for how it works and all the concepts of it. And it's really a growing thing. And I'm surprised at the, the traction it has with younger, younger players, because the, you would, you wouldn't think that a bunch of uh, people sitting around a table, rolling dice and telling a story together would gain traction um, in, in the, in the form of four hour videos with the group of students, our, our kids, who are perfectly capable of watching three hours worth of 10 minute videos, but can't be bothered to watch a half hour of any one thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm like that, so I get it. <laughs> but for some reason, watching people play D and D and getting into D and D through it has become a cultural phenomena. And I'm not going to say no to that. I, I'm all for more people who are enjoying the things that I like. And yeah, so there's also other gamification things out there that I forgot to, to suggest to Jason to put in there. Um, and there is one that is like the gold standard for gamifying like rewards in the classroom that I am completely blanking on the name of right now. But I've, I've seen it used for years. It's very successful. A teacher friend of mine has had a great deal of success with it. Uh, uh, class, something class craft. That was okay. it. Oh my God. I got there. I got there eventually. <laughs> the d and of the classroom. Yeah, yeah. That's actually, that slipped my mind as well. A classcraft um, actually is, it's not even the d and It's more the mobile game because they get pets and they get skins and they get all of those things that are the reward centers for what's, um, what are being trained up through mobile games. And they get uh, daily rewards for participating and they can, and the great thing is, is it gives you positive reinforcement um, by allowing you to put in things like you can get you, you can get a homework pass or something like that. And the fun thing is you can do things where you allow other students. So the other people in your group will all get a free 10 points on the next quiz or something where you're working towards group goals rather than individual goals, which helps out with students in a community. Okay, that was a wonderful conversation thank you so much mike for you know agreeing to do this with me early in the morning here uh thank you all for watching we of course look forward to future conversations about role-playing games specifically we have talks of doing a gaming as therapy panel and bringing in some wonderful guests for that uh but this has been a lit x uh teacher panel slash workshop so please, oh my God, it, should I say like and subscribe? Do people still do that? Oh no, that's so cringe. <laughs> <laughs> but we will hope to see you uh, at a con in person sometime soon, soon. as we do these different soon. things. Uh, and thank you all very much for watching. <laughs>